Following the murder of Mary Kelly, which took place in her room, 13 Millers Court, off Dorset Street in Spitalfields, at some time on the morning of Friday the 9th of November, 1888, journalists began arriving in the area to glean any information they could on the scene of the crime and about the victim herself. Amongst them was a reporter from the Evening News, whose subsequent article, which appeared in the newspaper on Saturday the 10th of November, provides us with a glimpse of the mood in the district in the aftermath of the crime and also gives us an insight into what the consensus was concerning the perpetrator of the deed. The article read, A representative of the Evening News, who spent the night on the scene of the murders attributed to the revengeful knife of Jack the Ripper, states that down to a late hour last night, the utmost excitement, if not terror, pervaded all classes of the population in the East End. The Dorset Street murder, with all its revolting details, was the one topic of conversation, and, as the closing hour of half-past twelve approached, there was an obvious renewal of the panic that ensued on the occasion of the recent double murder in Whitechapel. As then, so now, the thoroughfares which constitute the main arteries of traffic in the East End were deserted shortly after one o'clock, a strange scene to those accustomed to the bustle and turmoil of the Whitechapel streets far into the early morn. Ere an hour had passed after the midnight stroke, festive revellers had disappeared from the scene, while females of the unfortunate class were conspicuous chiefly by their absence. But peaceful though the appearance of the streets may have been, the sturdy burghers of the East End were not unmindful of the duties voluntarily undertaken by them a few weeks back. The members of the Vigilance Committee were everywhere to be seen, peering into dark and shady nooks that would afford even a suggestion for crime, while detectives in plain clothes and in overwhelming numbers were ever on the alert. But in the small hours of the morning, it must be confessed that Whitechapel looked dreariness itself. As the hours stole by, plainclothes detectives, both amateur and professional, left the scene of their monotonous perambulations, and once again the streets resounded only to the heavy mechanical tread of the blue-coated guardians of the night. Even the coffee stalls were deserted, and their owners, enraged at the long-continued paucity of nocturnal customers, did not hesitate to give free vent to their vocabulary of indignation. Jack the Ripper may, from his peculiar and monomaniacal point of view, be having a merry time of it, but coffee stall keepers think otherwise. This latest tragedy makes their prospects look even more gloomy than before, and the sullenness that comes of despair is rapidly stealing into the face of many an East End distributor of the cup that is said to cheer but not inebriate. Throughout yesterday, Dorset Street was the scene of intense excitement and the strong cordon of police drawn around the approaches to the street only with the utmost difficulty prevented the ever-increasing throng from breaking through. The search for the perpetrator of this, the most revolting of all the East End tragedies, has been kept up with the most persistent zeal, though so far without success. Yesterday a man was arrested and taken to Commercial Street Police Station on the suspicion of being Jack the Ripper, but subsequent information that came to hand led to his release. Late at night, a further arrest was made at the same station. Here again it is anticipated by the authorities that the inquiries will fail to establish the identity of the prisoner with Jack the Ripper, and his speedy release is anticipated. The authorities themselves readily admit that up to the present they have not the slightest clue as to the perpetrator of this atrocious murder. The audacity of the deed has startled everyone, and no more so than the police. The actual scene of the murder is Miller's Court, Dorset Street, though the locality is known to residents in the neighbourhood as McCarthy's Court. This is owing to the fact that a man named McCarthy is the chief owner or occupier of the houses there. A somewhat important fact has been pointed out which puts a fresh complexion on the theory of the murders. It appears that the cattle boats bringing live freight to London are in the habit of coming into the Thames on Thursdays or Fridays and to leave again for the continent on Sundays or Mondays. It has already been a matter of comment that the recent revolting crimes have been committed at the week's end, and an opinion has been formed among some of the detectives that the murderer is a drover or butcher employed on one of these boats, of which there are many, and he periodically appears and disappears with one of the steamers. This theory is held to be of much importance by those involved in the investigation, who believe that the murderer does not reside either in the locality or even in this country at all. 
It is thought that he may either be a person employed upon one of these boats or one who is allowed to travel by them, and inquiries have for some time been directed in following up the theory. It is pointed out that at the inquests on the previous victims, the coroners had expressed the opinion that the knowledge of anatomy possessed by a butcher would have been sufficient to enable him to find and cut out the parts of the body, which in several cases were abstracted. The audacity of the assassin seemed to be a very general theme among the crowds last night, and on all hands could be heard expressions of opinion that the probability was he was then among them, listening to their denunciations of him with diabolical enjoyment. This disposition of the crowd to look at each other for the criminal constituted a real peril for any stranger among them, the women especially making no secret of the longing they felt to lynch somebody, and it looked as though in one or two cases the police were compelled to make arrests to prevent something of the kind being attempted. It is generally admitted by the police that a murder attended by such hideous circumstances has never before been known. The deliberate manner in which the murderer has slain and mutilated his last victim has completely nonplussed the authorities. They state that they have adopted every possible precaution to entrap the fiend without success, and now that he has adopted the precaution of dissecting his unfortunate victims in their own houses, their ends are completely defeated.